Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you as we gather together today. Uh, whether you're joining us in person or online, I, I thank you uh, for pausing to be in prayer with us, to sing with us, uh, to come together in God's presence. Uh, as we gather together today, I did want to highlight uh, just a couple things. Uh, today is Transfiguration Sunday, because there's a word you use on a daily occasion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through what that means a little bit, but as we gather with the disciples on that mountainside with Jesus, uh, we'll ponder what that means for us. But this is also a transition week for us in our Christian calendar. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We will have worship on Wednesday, uh, both in person and online, so you can join us. Um, at 6.30 on Wednesday, we'll have our Ash Wednesday service. Uh, that kicks off for us the 40-day season of Lent. And during those 40 days, not counting Sundays, uh, we journey with Jesus. And, and we have a handful of things. If you receive our newsletter, you saw the, the email that went out yesterday that said, Preparing for Lent. Um, and we have a handful of ways to connect both in worship and reflection and study, as well as in service, coming up over the next few weeks. Lent traditionally is a time where we commit ourselves to fasting and prayer and, more, uh, and practices that help deepen our love of God and neighbor. So this year, our theme is Love God, Love Neighbor, and we're going to explore that and what that might look like for us uh, in the midst of this season in which we're living. Um, it's not always an easy call to live out love of God and love of neighbor. Um, and so we're going to struggle with what that means as we also give thanks for the joy that it brings and for the vision of God's kingdoms that we get to glimpse when we're in the midst of that work. I did want to highlight just two parts of that uh, that start this week. So uh, on this coming Thursday, we have a Lenten Bible study that we're going to do at 10 a.m. called Gathered Up in Jesus, and we're going to be reading through Luke and looking at uh, some of those stories of Jesus utilizing discipleship ministries, some of their worship resources to help shape our conversation in time. Also, uh, next Sunday, after uh, we'll begin that series, uh, Love God, Love Neighbor, and we have reflection groups that will kick off. Uh, one on Monday at noon, and then the, the next Sunday, the 13th, uh, at 9.15. We'll have space for us to have conversation to reflect on what we're hearing as we engage in worship together. Part of that is shaped by the book we're, re we're inviting you to consider. We know not everybody will go run out and grab a copy, but our sermon series is going to be shaped in conversation with a book called Toxic Charity that was written by Robert Lupton. It's a challenging read, um, mainly because it's very easy and accessible, but because of what he says. He kind of calls into the assumption that, oh, I'm doing good, and so therefore it should all be good. Reality is sometimes we do harm in the midst of seeking to do good. Um, and so I'm going to be using that as a conversation partner through our Lenten series. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. And at the end of March, we actually have a book club around that book. So that's lifting up some study and reflection opportunities. But service is also there. And you may notice that during Lent, our focus has been for the last few years uh, on our partnership with Wesley College in Tanzania. Education is really important to this congregation, and we had the gift and benefit of partnering with Eric and Liz Sword in their ministry in Tanzania for a decade. Uh, Eric and Liz have transitioned back to the States, but now he serves as the executive director for the Wesley College Foundation. Foundation. And so he's really doing a lot of work trying to highlight the work that's happening in Tanzania. We continue to be a partner, and so our Linton's second mile giving is always focused upon our partnership uh, with Tanzania, and particularly we're focusing it around Wesley College. Um, the other connection we have focused a lot on is with our mobile housing navigation center. And so you will see more stuff, including a card out there that has some of their favorite items that they've requested. That um, so we try to give those things which they would like, which would be a benefit and a gift to them. And so uh, Debbie worked with Kelsey to figure out what are some of those favorites that they have, things that they'd love to be able to grab on the shelf. Did you know that one of the first items that was most requested when we opened the Mobile Housing Navigation Center was fruit, fruit cups? They just wanted access to fruit, something that wasn't a, a starch in a can. 
Um, and so fruit cups became one of the things that they most loved getting from the food bank and from those gifts. So that's on the list. It's a number one item. Uh, soups and other pieces are on there as well. Uh, Vienna sausages, if you're a big fan. I am not. <laughs> but that's okay to each their own, right? Um, but nonetheless, you'll see more information. But all that to say, throughout Lent, it's a great time to more deeply connect to worship, to reflection and study, and to acts of service. And so may this Lent be an invitation to get a little more connected, a little more deeply connected uh, to your love of God and love of neighbor. That being said, as we gather this day and we meet Jesus on that mountainside where he is transfigured, may we have eyes and ears to know of God's presence among us today as we gather to worship. Let us worship God together. Please join me in the call to worship. Your response is, Jesus is the light of the world. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. We also come burdened down with the worries of the world and the struggles of our individual lives. Jesus, Jesus is the is light, light of, of the world. world. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God, our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together today in awe and wonder to worship the God who transforms our lives. Jesus is the light of the world. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as you are able as we sing together, Jesus, the light of the world. Will you stand?
the people of God said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to rise in body or spirit as we hear today's gospel lesson from Luke chapter 9. Reading of the story of the transfiguration from the Common English Bible. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes flashed like white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless, and at the time, told no one what they had seen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, boys and girls. Our scripture lesson today tells the story of when Jesus was transformed right and before the eyes of three of his disciples. You heard Pastor Brian read about it. Peter, James, and John go up to a mountain with Jesus to pray. And all of a sudden, while there, Jesus' face changed. His clothes become white like flash, like lightning. And two persons we know from way back in the times with the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah appear. Well, honestly, during that prayer time, the disciples got kind of sleepy, but boy, did they wake up in the midst of that. And they saw the glory and they experienced that moment of transformation. A time when Jesus, who was beautiful, was made even more beautiful. That word's kind of big. This Sunday is what we call Transfiguration Sunday. To be transformed. Hmm. First of all, let's look at the word. Transfigure. Transfigure. Will you say it with me? Ready? One, two, go. Transfigure. Figure. It's not a word we use on our everyday language, that's for sure. We actually probably only use it one time a year here in church. But the definition is important. Transform into something more beautiful or elevated. To be transfigured is to be transformed into something more beautiful or elevated. Well, my goodness, Jesus certainly was transformed or transfigured in our story today. So much so, the disciples wanted to stay there forever. But then they heard the voice of God saying, this is my son. Listen to him. And Jesus said, no, nah, got to go back down the mountain. Got to go back to the real world. 
got to go back to our teaching and learning, to our miracle doing, and to our journey to Jerusalem. We're about to go into the season of Lent, and it's a time of year we don't often think about being transformed. But I want you to look for moments of transformation in your life because it still happens. My favorite flower is tulip. Love them. I love to get the pot of tulips and bring them in the house. And I watch the stem come up and then that really tight bud of green. And then it slowly opens and I'm surprised by what color it is. And it's so beautiful. And I know that that ugly bulb in the dirt has been transformed into the most beautiful flower. As we go through spring, we're going to see flowers come out. Ugly stick branches are all of a sudden going to have amazing flowers on them. But transformation happens with us too. For many of us, we haven't been able to see our loved ones from far away for quite a while because of COVID. And so recently, a few folks have started it. Maybe you have too. And you've seen your grandparents for the first time in a long time. And you rushed and you hugged them. And it was such an amazingly beautiful moment. And in that moment, I believe you were transformed into something even more beautiful, as were your grandparents, because of the love you shared at that moment, the joy in that. But then you had to step away and you go back to catching up, back to everyday life. Oh, but the transformation happened. The change in your life happened. I think we need to look for those transformation, to look for the moments where something we thought has not been really beautiful or, uh, or maybe something that is beautiful is changed and turn it into something even more beautiful. And at that moment, we need to say, thank you, God, for that glimpse into a little bit of what it means to be transformed, to see the change from beautiful even to into more beautiful. I see that in you sometime, boys and girls, as I see you serve others when I see you, if you're in the children's choir, when you sing and you smile and I see something happen in your faces that is transformed in that moment as you sing praises to God. Let's keep our eyes out for moments of transformation, for moments of transfiguration. And remember this story. But here's the last line of this scripture we have to remember. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. As we see these moments of transfiguration, remember that beautiful flower happened because God loves us and loves creation. That amazing hug that you have is because God loves us. God is up watching us smiling. Jesus is wrapping his arms around us as we had that amazing hug. Let's get transformed more often. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this story today that reminds us that because of your love, everything can be made more beautiful. Amen. Have a great week. Our hymn of preparation is Be Thou My Vision, stanzas one and two. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able to sing together. <laughs>
as you're seated, I invite you to join me in prayer. Come, loving Jesus, be among us. May the power of your Spirit transform our hearts and our minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, be a gift unto you. Grant us eyes to see where it's easier to turn away, ears to hear where we might have been deaf, and hearts that are moved with compassion and mercy and justice. We pray these things now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. It's Transfiguration Sunday, and that's the level of excitement I expected, right? Because it is one of those Sundays in which we come to a story that, at least for us in the Protestant church, in the Methodist church, we read once a year. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those stories, though, that I want to highlight. Um, some would argue is one of those pivotal moments in Jesus' journey and ministry in life. Baptism being one of those. Uh, certainly the crucifixion, the resurrection, those are certainly important moments, but that this story would also be one. Because in it, there are a handful of lessons in this small little story that we could pull from it. Right? There's something about when he goes to the mountain that he has a practice of prayer. We should pay attention to this. He has regularly taken time aside to pray whether he felt the need or not, whether he had a question that was burning or it was simply just the need to pull away from the chaos, Jesus regularly practiced prayer. And so here we see that in this moment he practices prayer. Though this one a little different, he brings with him some of his most trusted disciples, those who have been closest to him, that have been uh, right there at his side. Now the irony is, of course, that they struggle to stay awake, which is a repeated occasion when they come to that time of prayer with him in Gethsemane, when they struggle to stay awake, when he, it says that he is in such anguish that it's though he is bleeding as he prays. Now, there's another lesson there that certainly we could pull out for leadership that says, hey, make sure you have an inner circle of people who know the vision, who know the mission. But today's story really doesn't make the case for that because, well... At the end of this encounter, they say, well, maybe we should build something here so we can just come back to this place. Therefore, in many ways, probably <laughs> reminding the church that our need to put a physical space around transformative experiences still continues. Uh, we still have that desire. Maybe we should just build a retreat center here. We should build a church here. There would be a church built there later down the road. But today, I want to invite us to the definition that Debbie invited our kids to. That transfiguration could be a synonym of transform. Another word might even be metamorphosis. There is a, a change in form or appearance that happens in this story. One definition is a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful state. Jesus is elevated in this moment. And there beside him are two of Arguably Israel's most central characters, Moses and Elijah. Moses, that, that one who had journeyed with them as they walked out of slavery in Egypt, he was the one that would bring them guidance and the commandments of God. He would walk them through the wilderness toward the promised land. Each of the first part of our Bible, the Torah, is, a, is appointed and connected to Moses. This is one of those characters that would arrive in this moment. Though the other thing that we should note is that Moses also was not always received with great joy. He was often rejected and pushed against. Certainly he was no... Uh, Moses was not... A, uh, the Pharaoh, the leaders of, of Egypt were not a fan of Moses. And even the people weren't when they got out away from Egypt and were in the wilderness. The second person that... A, appears in our story, Elijah, a prophet and a miracle worker. In fact, if you read the stories of him in 1 Kings and throughout the Old Testament, he speaks and kings tremble. He calls upon rain and then he calls for the ceasing of rain. He calls down fire and those things happen. And he's swept up in a chariot of fire such that there's a mystery that connects to his death as well as that of Moses, I might add. 
These are the ones that are present when Jesus' face is changed. These are the ones that are there. Debbie asked a question this week of me, and I've pondered it throughout the week. If we were to have that moment today where Jesus was in our midst and his face was transformed, who might be the prophets of our day that are standing there? Who would be those that we would look to, um, that we would need their witness, their example, their story? And you know, I've pondered that some this week. Now, Nikki and I have worked really hard in our reading of stories and other things to elevate and raise voices that Charlotte would experience in her life, also of the incredible voices of women throughout history. One of our favorite books that I've actually shared with you on a Sunday morning does that very thing. It kind of highlights different women throughout history. Her more contemporary names like Malala, who raised the need of education in her own community, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Those who pressed for justice and a, and a reminder not to forget the most vulnerable. And so the gift of that journey is that we regularly are reading and talking about women who have been leaders in our own time and in the times just before us. This week, ironically, it was not a, there were two names that came to mind for me when I thought about who might be those modern-day prophets whose voices we need, and one of those was Gandhi, who sought to walk in a way that, that showed peace takes real sacrifice, that living in light of oppressive forces is not one where you fight violence with more violence, but you choose a very different way. I was reminded of, of Oscar Romero, a priest who walked the way that led to his own death in the face of violence and atrocities. And I'm mindful of all of this as we pray and watch the tensions in Ukraine and Russia. And we hear people cry out for a different way that we know where this leads. And so I came this week to, uh, to find these words to be very powerful and also challenging. Um, Maren Tarabasi, who Debbie often reads her, her blog that she puts out, had a guest post this week by a friend and an archbishop in the country of Georgia. And in that post and in his writings, he said these things as far as what we might do as we pray continually for pre peace, but as we put our prayers into action. And I want to share a couple of the things he said. He said, praying is essential, but this is not nearly enough. The prayer should be accompanied by action, and this action will become a prayer itself. I felt my legs were praying, wrote Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel after the protest walk to Selma. Similarly, similarly, we need to be engulfed in prayerful action. And he says these words, If we can use our hands to stop the war, we should use our hands. If we can use our brains to stop the war, we should use our brains. If we can use our voice to stop the war, we should use our voice. If we could use our resources to stop the war, we should use our resources. If we can use our time and energy to stop the war, we should use our time and energy. He goes on to say, while striving to stop the war, we should also need to commit ourselves to sow compassion to all those innocents who have already been afflicted by the war. He would go on to say that in, it is indeed a time of sadness, frustration, and anguish. But these circumstances should never blind our perspective that in the end justice will prevail, hatred and lies will be defeated, love and compassion will definitely win. It is essential to believe that the forces of darkness and stupidity will fail. It's always been the case. It shall always be the case. Therefore, let us heed the words of the prophet Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. He reminded me that something in the story of transfiguration is that the disciples couldn't quite catch the vision that this Jesus was more than their current Messiah that would save their current problem, but was truly the Son of God. Calling for a very different way of seeing the world and that that should be held on to. Not the shrines we might build in those moments, but a transformation, truly an elevation of what it means to where the world in which we're living 
becomes a reflection of the kingdom of God. When we talk about God's love and grace, we don't talk about it as simply something that is so far off, but something that should impact our here and our now. It should be with us in moments when we find ourselves at the brink of another war. It should also be the thing that drives us and reminds us to hang on when we find in ourselves a weariness to make another step. This story, while it's a small one in the bigger picture, invite us to believe. To believe that God has been and will continue to be transforming the world. And it starts right as we've often sung in us. When we pray for peace, may peace begin with me. May it begin in my actions, in my words, in my movement day in and day out. Belief does truly change our eyes over time. It does change our hearts to be moving. But sadly, when we find ourselves in the midst of this place, it can be easy to lose heart. Some days I'm there. Some days I'm a lot more like the disciples than I'd like to admit. I have a moment where maybe I've glimpsed God's goodness, where I've seen something that's transformative. As a pastor, I sometimes feel I'm given front seats front seats to the transformative work of God. I get a chance to glimpse that when we baptize a child. When I stand with a couple who commit themselves in marriage, when I walk with a family through great celebrations, but I also see it in the sacred moments when I walk a family and their loved one to the end of the journey. Whether it's through hospice or tragic loss, that even in those moments of brokenness, they are not without hope. I see the love of God um, um, oftentimes emerge in the way that they care for one another, in the way that the community walks alongside them. But yet, even in all those moments, I too fall into the trap of the disciples of being weary, of being tired, of thinking, can we really see the truth come through? This week, as we were standing in the Welcome Center on Wednesday, uh, myself and another adult were talking about the challenges and the issues we heard in Ukraine. And wouldn't you know that one of our kids said, why is it that, you know, we, we were struggling with, why is it that we're here again? And he goes, what is it about people that want power? And one of our children recognized how deceptive and broken it could be that, they, that we long for that and what destruction it can do. An elementary student can recognize it. And yet, we adults sometimes fail to see it. But I was reminded that the gift of those moments, and the gift of that moment, was I was reminded that a child can see that our longing and our striving sometimes for power is to our own demise. That there is something about sharing this life together, of walking with one another, it's moments like that that call me back from my own weariness and exhaustion. It's moments like that where I'm reminded that I, I and you get a chance to see glimpses of the kingdom of God. <laughs> so how might we long for that and see that as a church? How might we hold on to the hope that the world truly will be transformed? It's okay, Simon. I get it. How will we feel that? Will, are we those who are are looking for how God is changing us and the world around us. And in the midst of that, recognizing Jesus has been present with us all along and will continue to go the journey with us. And he said, I'm not leaving you orphaned. While I'm leaving you, I'm giving you my spirit. And so God's spirit continues to walk with us. We don't, we're not meant to walk this journey alone. We're not meant to do it on our own. So may God give us the grace and the presence this day to know to hang on. May the hope of God's goodness and mercy and justice dwell in us such that we heed the words of the Archbishop that if we can use our hands this week to be a sign of grace and mercy, of justice, that we would do it. That there's opportunity for our brain, our voice, our resources to be used toward the kingdom of God, toward reflecting God's goodness and justice and mercy, 
May it be the case among us, brothers and sisters in Christ. May we be the people of God. Sometimes, much like the disciples struggling to figure it out, but always doing the very best we can to stay connected to the one who invites us to come and follow. May this journey that we begin in the weeks ahead in Lent be an opportunity for us to deepen our love of God as we seek to have clear eyes of those neighbors God calls us to love as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our response is that final stanza of Be Thou My Vision. Will you join your voices in sung prayer? <laughs> into our time of prayer, as always, I'm going to invite you to take in a breath and lift up to God those things that you need to give to God. And as you exhale, give them fully to God, knowing that they will be taken care of. This morning for our time of silent prayer, I invite you to pray with the children of the Ukraine in the midst of all that's going on in that country. There are hundreds of thousands of children whose lives have been turned upside down. Will you pray with them? Listener of our souls, when we would become adept at trickery, you hand us the rule book on fair play you have written. When we would brag about all our achievements, your glory silences our prattling so we can hear your soft whispers of wonder. Listener to our hearts, when we memorize all the goals and objectives taught to us by sin and death, you become the nemesis of our mismanaged lives. When we become so hard-headed, we butt at grace, you soften our pride with the warmth of your tenderness. Mirror of God's love, when our lives are veiled with pride and ignorance, you turn us inside out to reveal who we truly are. When we turn our hearts this way and that, thinking that God's glory resembles some abstract art, you pull out a snapshot of Jesus from your purse. God and community, holy in one, with you we never lose heart even as we pray as we were taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather now in a time to lift before God our lives and God's tithes, I'm mindful today of the ways in which we benefit from the presence of our music ministry. It sometimes calls us to the text, to the scripture, 
uh, to the hope of life in ways that, honestly, the spoken word just can't do the same. And so today as we give, I give thanks for the ways in which that support allows not only music to be sung by adults, but by, by our young people as well as our children. Um, that from early on, even in my own family, I've seen the gift of music. Um, I also laugh a little because every time I think of the gift of music, I think of my daughter getting upset that Debbie changed the last song of Go Now in Peace about the time Charlotte figured out all the hand movements. <clears throat> and at not even two years old, she was very irate with Debbie when she came over to tell her. So maybe some things aren't just reserved for the older adults in our life, right? Um, but I'm grateful because, because of those songs, like Be Thou My Vision, they connect us to God's grace that goes with us. That's why it is so important to us. Sometimes we don't have the words to say it, but those songs become songs upon our heart that help write the story of faith sometimes into our memory, into our mind, and certainly into our voices. So today, as we pause to lift to God God's tithes as well as offer our very lives, may the gift of music meet us in the midst of our need and remind us of the presence of the Spirit that sings to us God's love and grace and mercy and justice day in and day out. Let us give with thanksgiving.
Please join me in prayer. Transforming God, we come to your altar this morning, knowing that in our giving and in our living, we have often put just enough into living our faith so as not to impact our lifestyle or cause too much discomfort. We have been reluctant to let go of our affinity for the things of this world, and in our attachments, we have often missed the opportunity for the transformed lives you desire for us. May our offering this morning be an invitation to living a life radically transformed by your power, love, and grace. We pray this in the mighty love of Jesus. Amen. And so as we go out into the world, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus and all that we do. As we prepare to go forth today, I'm mindful of, of our text in light of our benediction. Our benediction is a, a version of the fourfold uh, Franciscan blessing. It's one that often both encourages me and sometimes I might even confess haunts me uh, with a blessing as more of a responsibility, a hearing. And so I'm going to offer you this blessing today. It's this fourfold blessing from the, trans, the Franciscan tradition. It says, May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. May the love of God move you to greater love of neighbor this week. Amen.